Good evening, everyone. Glad you could all come out on this uh, rainy Monday evening. Welcome to the Issues and Answers City Council Candidate Forum. I'm uh, Ron Milhorn, News Director at KMTS, and I'll be the moderator tonight. The event is brought to you courtesy of tonight's sponsors, the Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association, Glenwood Springs Post Independent, and KMTS. Questions have been collected from the public in advance and sorted to avoid duplication and to ensure that a wide variety of topics are addressed tonight. We will not be taking questions from the audience. The event is also available virtually via Zoom, as well as streaming live on Facebook on both the Post Independent and KMTS pages. KMTS will rebroadcast the event. Links to the recording will be posted to the postindependent.com, kmts.com, and glenwoodchamber.com after the event. As the moderator, I'll ask the questions of the candidates. Uncontested candidates will have five minutes to address the audience. Candidates running in contested races will each give a two-minute opening statement. Questions will be asked in alternating order by last name. There will be a limit time limit of 90 seconds assigned for answering questions. The candidate that answers the question first will have the opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal. Each candidate will be allowed a two-minute closing statement. Our timer tonight is Sarah Teal. She will hold up a card reminding tonight's speakers that they have 30 seconds left to answer a question. She will also let them know when their time is up. All right, we'll begin tonight with uh, Ward 1 candidates running unopposed, Marco Dame. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Ron, and uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. My name is Marco Dame. I am Councillor uh, Ward 1. I was appointed about a year ago to uh, finish a uh, term, my predecessor's term. Uh, these upcoming years will actually be my first official term. <clears throat> so instead of making a case why you should vote for me, I uh, thought I would give you a quick review of my first year and tell you, my, uh, tell you about my future priorities. Uh, that said, I'll start with some issues that were in front of council last year uh, that were also uh, adopted or uh, approved by council. And those items are uh, actually, um, sorry, I feel proud and honored to have been part of adopting uh, those items. Uh, first, we awarded a contract to Habitat for Humanity to build 20 or so affordable for sale housing units. Uh, then we moved issue 2C to the ballot in November. The uh, voter approved 2.5% accommodation tax is a fantastic step forward to secure funding for workforce housing. Uh, we decided on two A-line breaks for I-70. Uh, these uh, permanent temporary on-ramps will be constructed later on this year. Uh, later in the year, during budget season, we approved a $107 million budget. I know this is a rather large budget for a city our size, but um, we are, as you know, a full service community with many, many enjoyable amenities. And they all cost money. Um, and just last week, one of my highlights is to adopt the 2023 comprehensive plan update. Uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of countless hours went into this. It is a community generated document and I am happy to see it uh, come to completion. Uh, we also adopted a single hauler trash contact, sorry, contract. We initiated the uh, transportation management plan and we approved staff compensation and cost of living increases. Um, what I do look forward to for the next four years, um, and, I, and I hope some of these items will not take uh, four years to complete, uh, but the top of the list, as it always has been for the past few years and probably will be for a while, is the creation of workforce housing. Uh, we are in the process currently of um, creating a 2C workforce housing board or commission, however you want to call it, to help identifying projects and find ways to tap into state money uh, that was also made available for affordable housing during last election cycle. 
I also want to focus strongly on economic development to attract a variety of businesses, large and small, to ensure vitality and strong sales tax revenue. On a side note, our 22 sales tax revenues have increased by about 8%, which is fantastic. Uh, I'd like to keep working on fire and natural disaster safety and Glenwood's resilience during such an unthinkable event. Uh, funding for South Bridge and a regional evacuation management plan come to mind. Um, I would like to start the discussion about creating a growth management plan to identify specific, specific uses for specific parcels. This will aid in the sustainable smart growth that we're all striving for. I also want to scrutinize, this is a strong word, but I do want to scrutinize the budget a little bit to see if we can possibly identify some funding sources to reappropriate to street repairs. We do have a certain amount, but we need more. And I also want to promote the arts and cultural events like I have been, and I want to move forward with preserving and presenting Glenwood Springs' his history the correct way it deserves. When it comes to council interaction, I would like to promote efficiency and strong collaboration. I'd also like to foster the discussions that continue to produce sustainable solutions for Glenwood Springs. With that said, I'd like to wish all the candidates good luck and I'll be honored to serve with any of you, but there can only be seven. <laughs> Last but not least, a quick shout out to our city hall employees. We honestly would not be the community we are without them. So thank you employees. Thank you to the hosts and thanks for coming out. Have a good evening. Next, I'd like to invite Ward 4 candidate Mitchell Weimer, running unopposed. Okay, perfect. All right, Ron, thank you, Angie, thank you. Um, for, for pulling this together. Thank you to uh, everyone uh, here and, and online for spending a little bit of time to try to understand who we are and, and um, educate yourselves a little bit before you're dropping off those ballots. I think it's such an important step in our democracy to, to kind of educate ourselves and, 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 and learn as much as we can before making those decisions. Uh, my name is Mitchell Weimer. Uh, I will be uh, the next representative for Ward 4. Uh, Paula Stepp has done a great job, I feel, uh, in representing our ward uh, for the last four years. She has chosen not to run again. Uh, and so after uh, a few conversations, uh, I decided uh, that it made sense for, for me to step up at this time and give back a little bit to the community uh, that I feel is, is, is currently giving me so much. Um, as a little bit of a background, I kind of want to hit three things with you guys tonight. I want to do a little bit of background because I think I'm probably the least known person uh, as far as candidates. Um, a little bit of what I feel are my qualifications uh, and, and preparations uh, for taking, taking a chair up here. Uh, and then the third is just a quick closing, just how to contact me because I think that that two-way sort of relationship is gonna be really important moving forward. Uh, I'm a Colorado native. Uh, I grew up in Wiggins, Colorado. Raise your hand if you know where Wiggins Colorado. Hey, one, two, four. Hey, uh, it's a, it was at the time it was a town of 800 people, uh, and there were 19 kids in my high school class, and 12 of us had been together since kindergarten. So, it was a great place to grow up, and it was a wonderful place to leave after after graduation. It was like the best of small town, worst of small town. Uh, went to Boulder, got a degree, but that really wasn't my focus. I was much more into ROTC. Uh, during my time there. Uh, after graduation, I spent five years as an army officer. I was in the field artillery, uh, a little bit of time uh, here domestically, a little bit of time abroad in South Korea, and then I wrapped things up again in Washington State. Left the army, got my MBA at University of California at Davis, uh, and from there have spent the last 20-ish, 20 20-something 20 years um, either working as a retail leader or as a management consultant 
mostly to retailers. So uh, big names like Bed Bath & Beyond, Home Depot, I worked with. Um, I, I was a consultant for a while with Deloitte Consulting. I'm now with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, in a sense, um, I help big companies make big, complicated decisions. And, and I think that I'll touch on that here and again, because I think that's an interesting qualification. Um, I met my partner, Cole Berger, uh, when we were both living in Washington, DC, and we were on the East Coast for a bit. Uh, we moved back uh, to the... Um, South Park uh, subdevelopment area. It's just south of the high school there. Uh, if you know um, uh, uh, the Andersons, Phil and Joan Anderson, we bought their house. Um, people tell us that, you know, hey, you bought this house, take care of it. So we, it was a little bit of an additional responsibility when we moved in. And we've just absolutely have been embraced by this community. We have wonderful neighbors. We're making incredible friends. Uh, Cole and I both have family in the area. Uh, and you know, you look out the front door, the front window, and there's just 101 things that you want to go and and do and spend your time. I, I I know this place is amazing, and I absolutely respect uh, and prioritize what it is that makes us amazing here. Um, that being said, uh, moving on to um, what I think are some of my qualifications and, and preparations, uh, I've been on the planning and zoning committee for a little over a year now. Um, I, I think that's been a good sort of intro into the, into the workings and going on, goings on up here. Uh, Cole and I spend a little bit of time each month uh, cooking for extended table over at the Presbyterian uh, Church. That's been a good sort of another avenue out into the community. Uh, and I've recently sat with every uh, sitting council member. Uh, I've met with staff. I've met with other local uh, leaders to just try to understand uh, the context that you're getting yourself into. I've got 30 seconds left. It's never enough time. Um, I think that, you know, my background as a, as a, as a consultant to these big companies, it's a lot of stakeholders, very difficult issues. The answers aren't always simple. It requires a lot more listening and understanding than it does uh, coming in with what you think are answers. And it's a lot of that same attitude that I plan to bring to uh, to the chair here. Other than that, I'm on Facebook, Mitchell Weimer. Uh, and uh, Marco's and mine uh, blurbs came out in the paper about three hours ago. And you can learn more about our things there. So thank you for your time. Have a good night. Now I'd like to invite the Ward 1 or uh, Ward 3 candidates. Sumner Schachter and Charlie Woolman. All right, we'll begin with two minute opening statements and uh, Sumner, you're first. Okay, thank you. A disclaimer in the investment business has always been past performance is no guarantee of future results. I don't have a past performance as your council member. However, I have served on many commissions and boards over the past decades and have not been shy about publicly stating my opinions and positions. So while past performance is not a guarantee of future results, my past performance may help you understand what you may be getting when you place me on council. Listen, learn, lead. I built a history of listening, learning, and then leading to cooperative, inclusive, and reasonable solutions. Some successful outcomes have been on the Roaring Fork School District Board. I was part of a team that helped lead the district from financial difficulty to financial stability, to transition to new leadership, and to help implement the inclusive interest-based bargaining process. On Garfield Adult Literacy Board, which is now Literacy Outreach, I was part of a team asked to step in to establish financial stability and management, new management, and part of the team that mandated and included English as a second language, where it previously had been deliberately excluded. Imagine Glenwood, many of you know, Diane and I are very proud of that inclusive group that has made a connection between stakeholders and decision makers. In our police search, chief search, I successfully advocated for Latino participation 
as well as seeking out Latino leaders for input. 2C Workforce Housing, I was proud to be part of that team, maybe the most diverse and representative group and commission. I was one of the first that the city reached out to for to fight RMI, PNZ. And lately, um, I'm very proud to be part of the team that was on the steering committee for the comp plan that with staff developed and identified a list of Glenwood character, which I would use to evaluate proposals and growth and issues. Do they preserve and enhance Glenwood character? Thanks for the opportunity. You have a choice. Charlie, two minutes. Thank you. When I began to run, I saw a quote in the paper and it said, a politician tells constituents what they want to hear an elected official governs. Over the last four years, I have been elected official. I haven't said things to get votes. I haven't said things not to get votes. I've done what I believe is right for the city of Glenwood Springs. I've lived in Glenwood for 47 years. And during that time, I like Sumner have served on multiple boards and commissions. But since 2008, I've been focusing on the city, serving on the Downtown Development Authority, including the development of 7th Street into what is now known as Restaurant Row, and adding the parking structure. I have comprehensive knowledge of the city operations. I have probably the most complete understanding of city council members of the city budget, the city budgeting process. I have served on the Financial Advisory Board and the Transportation Commission before I began on council and been on their liaison for a period of time. Um, so those are the things that I've done in my base of my knowledge. I, along with the city council, have accomplished many things over the last four years. We brought back the recycling center to downtown. We enacted limits on short-term rentals. We enacted a comprehensive uh, street reconstruction program, something that hadn't been done for a number of years. We, in we initiated citywide cost-effective broadband service. I have pushed individually for the completion of the Sixth Street uh, rebuild project and have been actively engaged in the North Landing. In the next four years, the goals I'd like to do would be to take the comprehensive plan and take those priorities and make it part of the city council strategic plan. I, through my service at Colorado Municipal League Board of Directors also intend to continue to advocate for the rural needs and to prevent the statewide uh, enactment of zoning standards that they think are good for them, but aren't necessarily good for the local community. I would ask for your vote and I promise you my full efforts over the next four years. Thank you. All right, first question, we'll begin with uh, Charlie. 90 second response. Name the three most important issues facing Glenwood Springs and your ideas on how to address them. So I think there isn't any question that the, the workforce housing and how to get owner occupied workforce housing is one of the most important things we need to do. As Marco pointed out, we entered into a project with Habitat in order to begin that process, owner occupied workforce housing. We need to be able to provide housing for our teachers, our service industry, and all aspects of our population, no matter ethnicity or economic background. The second important issue is traffic. We need to figure out how to manage the amount of traffic coming through Glenwood. City Council has, a, has a passed a traffic management action plan, which will lead to a tra transportation demand management plan. All these will help working with RAFTA to, to create a better transportation system and hopefully to reduce the impact from the people who come from the west end of the county coming into the town. Finally, as I mentioned before, it's important that I, as a member of the Colorado Municipal League Board of Directors, lead the local uh, efforts to make sure that we are mandated to do things. Last year, the state legislature, this, this current year, they're trying to get a re uh, requirement that the city be given the right of first refusal, which would seriously impinge upon uh, local landowner rights. Those are the kind of things that I've done. I'm an effective leader, both at the state and local level. Same question, Sumner. Would you repeat it, please, Ron? Certainly. Name the three most important issues facing Glenwood Springs and 
your ideas on how to address them? Well, I'm not sure I differ greatly from Charlie in terms of what they are, but maybe impact. Uh, I think as I've walked the neighborhoods, I'm gonna be global. I've heard take care of us as one of the major issues. And I would make that globally. That means continue to take care of our infrastructure, our roads, our streets, our, and do what we can to manage the costs for our utilities, electric, garbage collection, which council has done. Um, I think safety has become a major issue in terms of evacuation, um, traffic evacuation, the proposed traffic safety plan that's in the works, fire prevention, as well as our safety force in terms of police, fire, and EMTs. Uh, the third issue is growth and housing. I lump them together, how we can come up with reasonable growth as Marco addressed the reasonable growth plan uh, to provide and we cannot solve the housing issue. And I'm proud to say, I believe the housing commission and I was one of the major catalysts to get projects like Habitat started. So we have to nip away at the problem to get employee workforce housing for Glenwood employees and more owner occupied in a manner that makes sense for Glenwood character. Charlie, one minute rebuttal or sure. response? And I agree, I think Sumner and I are probably very similar in a lot of these issues. The, the differences that, that I bring to you is that I've got the background in working with the infrastructure system. In 2019, when I ran for election, we tried to pass the sales tax to increase the street tax, that failed. We didn't just give up, we undertook a comprehensive program. Streets have been ignored for years by former city council. We took action to make sure that that didn't occur in the future. We are putting the money and the resources into doing that and into long-term visioning in order to get the best possible infrastructure system we could have. We have engaged in evacuation and, and emergency planning. We were doing that last year and we have continued to do it. And as, as Marco pointed out, we have uh, emergency access is gonna be constructed. I also agree that sustainable growth is one of those issues in the comprehensive plan the council needs to put as the top priority. Next question, we'll begin with Sumner. Affordable or attainable housing is a statewide issue. Glenwood Springs has taken steps to tackle the problem, but what more can be done at the local level, even regional level? Thank you. It is a major problem and it's not limited to Glenwood and we are not the sole providers who can solve it. We were affected by the Valley. So there are a couple more things that we can do or will do. One, the passage of 2C, which I took a very proud part of was huge in terms of giving us a local source of housing. And I have a projection from some habitat experts that indicate over the next 20 years, we could provide housing for perhaps a thousand households that work and live here in Glenwood. Um, being part of the regional housing group is a great start. And we are also hoping, hopefully leveraging 2C and our staff will be trying to meet the parameters to compete for the great amount of Proposition 123 um, funding that was passed in the state. So those are several that we can begin with right away and are proceeding with. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Affordable attainable housing is a very, very difficult process. There are no easy answers. There's no magic button we can push and solve it. Housing and traffic, which we talked, I talked about earlier, are interwoven. We need to provide more workforce housing to reduce the impacts on traffic. Those two things are together. The only way we can get that is to create regional solutions to this problem. We have to work at a collaborative method to, to reach out to the communities up valley and down valley in order to come up with plans. That's why our transportation management uh, says, uh, programs that we're enacting and we've been moving on are gonna help us get there. One of the strengths I have as a, as a person is a collaborative ability, the ability to collaboratively reach results. I work as a mediator as part of my current practice that teaches me those skills. I have brought those skills both here at the state level. 
talk about Proposition 123 funding, there is a plan going on right now at the state level of how that's going to be spent. It is critical that we have a voice at that level that I could provide to make sure that 123 funding doesn't just go to metropolitan areas, but is here in Glenwood Springs. Sumner, one minute, one minute response or rebuttal? Well, what I would say is we cannot afford to wait for regional solutions. We hope to participate in them, but to wait for Up Valley or even regional housing um, would be a mistake. But I do not want to ignore that. I will participate hopefully wherever we can. However, we have taken steps independently and we should. Planning and zoning housing has helped council move to greater inclusionary housing and it's had an impact on our available units. The Habitat Project, which I helped uh, and we've embraced is huge and that is not part of regional other than Habitat is. And likewise, 123, hopefully we can compete against the front range. One of the big issues will be getting our staff to be able to evaluate and establish the very difficult baseline that they require to compete. That combined with regional will hopefully give us the leverage we need, but I'm not willing to wait for them. Thank you. Next question, we'll deal with development. Um, Charlie, is Glenwood Springs overdeveloped or is there room for growth and where? What type of growth? I don't think, Glenwood Springs is, is they have very little space in which to expand. The comprehensive plan has done a great job of identifying areas of growth that we need to look at. We have a, a number of city owned parcels. And one of the things when we work on the growth management study that is being done right now, and it'll be important for the council to enact is how to best use the land that we have available to leverage with other, uh, other entities like Habitat and other similar types of entities to leverage that money to get more workforce housing. And that is owner occupied workforce housing. I agree with Sumner. Regional, don't, we can't wait for regional plans. We have to do this now. There is areas that we can grow reasonably and sustainably. We have to be careful with those. We need to provide effective housing. We need to find, provide owner occupied housing. That has to be at the forefront. Apartments don't cut it, ownership does. <clears throat> In terms of development and growth, I've been a strong advocate, of, again, of establishing what is Glenwood character, not generic small town character. And thankfully, we've adopted now, thanks to staff and council, we have a list of what constitutes Glenwood character. That will be a benchmark of should projects go forward or not? Do they enhance and preserve Glenwood character in terms of housing? We can do a lot of development neutral growth as well. Um, down payment assistance, deed restrictions, um, deed restriction payments. So housing can be converted to reasonable cost for employee-based housing, um, ADU incentives. So there are many things we can do that would be development neutral that don't, don't expand growth. I will say that I'm on record to have voted against the um, Seven Canyon. I voted against the Walmart apartments. I was in a minority there because I don't believe Glenwood has a need for large free market apartments at this point. We need owner occupied, more affordable housing. Um, 480 Don, uh, Donovan, Don, Donigan, I was part of the unanimous vote against it. However, we did provide the developed developer and council for many suggestions for what would be a more suitable development. And they did respond, not enough apparently, and we'll never know whether it would have been better, but there are ways for responsible growth. Thank you. One minute response. Yes, it's easy to use the word glow with character. And I think it means something to each one of you out there in the audience, just like it does to me. What I've done every time I voted over the last four years is to vote to maintain the community that we live in. This is a great city. We have great character. Part of that is that we are accepting of people of all backgrounds. We're, we're accepting of all reasonable methods of trying to provide housing for those people. Growth is, is a problem, but it, there are solutions for it, but they require us to make sustainable growth 
related decisions. That will allow us to maintain the character, not words, actions. You both touched on character and charm. And I don't know if you want to expound on that because that was, that was my next question or we can move on to another topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be glad so what's to the next question? <laughs> um, here's one, okay. <laughs> Does Glenwood Springs need another grocery store? Is there anything in the hopper? Well, I have a question of you, Ron. Number one, I'd be glad to expound on Glenwood character given the opportunity. And your other question, which one do you want answered? Let's go with character and charms. Let's, we're, we're okay, so let's see. Um, we'll so get to the grocery store later. It uh, is more than words. However, I am very proud to have been a huge catalyst with the help of our comp plan steering committee and a tremendous amount of work by staff to change the draft to say right at the beginning where we have goals and actions, we don't wanna hear generic small town character. What is Glenwood character that we are trying to preserve, enhance and protect? And we came up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 or 13 identifiable characteristics with references in the comp plan, social diversity, compact walkable neighborhoods, sustainable tourism, um, historic architecture and neighborhoods, regional partnerships, resiliency, sustainability, livability for all that includes housing for all. Those are characteristics that will guide, I believe the city and will guide me in my decision-making. So that is the answer to a lot of your question. These are things that I'll be using. If a proposal comes up, and enhances, protects, and preserves most of these characteristics, I'm gonna be looking very interested. If a proposal comes up that does not hit many of these, I'm gonna question why are we dealing with it? That is what Glenwood character specific to our wonderful town is. Thank you. Charlie, nice thanks. Sense. And I appreciate everything Sumner did in working in the comprehensive plan. He was uh, an important voice in that plan and an important voice in developing that plan. Unfortunately, as a member of city council, we don't get engaged in that because we ultimately have to decide how it's going to be adopted. In the first work, first work session we had with the Planning Zoning Commission, this idea of small town character versus Glenwood character was raised. And everyone there, council members, the, the commission members, and the, the uh, uh, comprehensive plan people all agreed that we needed to come up and use the word Glenwood character, that we were Glenwood. We weren't a small town. We were Glenwood. That was important. And I have done by my actions throughout the four years, always voted for things that, that sustain Glenwood's character. Livability, all those things are things that we decide each day. Sometimes they, do, they involve such mundane, th mundane things as providing a better water system. We reacted to the floods that occurred after the, the, uh, the Grizzly Creek fire by rebuilding the entire water, not rebuilding the entire water section system, but by making significant improvements to that. That helps the livability of this community. Those are the hard decisions. How do you get that money? How do you spend it wisely in order to have this to be a great community with great infrastructure services that we all need? One minute response. No, no, not necessary. Thank right. you. Okay. Now the grocery store. <laughs> Charlie, uh, does Glenwood Springs need another grocery store? Actually, one of the things, and it hasn't been published too much, one of the things that I put in my campaign literature when I first started this is my desire to continue to work with staff to get a second grocery store. When Safeway pulled out, there was a lot of discussions made about could we get Trader Joe's? And I, like a bunch of other people, wrote to Trader Joe's and said, hey, you got to come to Glenwood. And then you talk to staff and you learn the problem is we're not on their distribution route. But we do need a second grocery store. I think it's important, particularly to get one in the West Glenwood area. Had the 480 Donegan process gone through, the developer said they were going to give us, they had links and they thought they could get us a second grocery store. That was important in my vote for that project. That in the park that we got, that in the fire, the fire uh, uh, acre land for a new fire station that we need for safety out there. So all these things are things you have to look at as a council member. I think another grocery store will help make sure that city market Kroger continues to serve the citizens, make sure there are things in the shelf. It isn't the problem of them. It's the fact that we only have one place to shop. Each of you and I go and buy a dozen eggs and suddenly there are no eggs. 
each of you and I go in there and buy a loaf of bread, suddenly there's no bread. These are not easy solutions. We need to go out and actively try to engage in some smaller chains that are on their distribution change, chain, and so we can get a second grocery store in Glenwood and place it out in West Glenwood. Summer? Well, the simple answer to a complex problem is also yes, we do need another grocery store and the demographics indicate West Glenwood, that would be a huge uh, benefit to our traffic through downtown and Grand Avenue if we had an outlet. I don't know the demographics that are driving the economic decisions by the grocers. It seems unusual to me with the traffic that we have in our surrounding area with Whole Foods, with, with um, Costco nearby that we can't somehow convince somebody that we have the demographics and traffic to justify it. That would be a huge priority for our economic development here in the city to continue to advocate for that and come up with a solution in West Glenwood. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I have the questions. Thank you. As Subject said the last one, I don't think there's any response needed. We both agree on the need for that. So. Okay. Senator, what is your take on the, the homeless issue in and around Glenwood Springs? Some citizens have expressed concern, even fear about walking around Two Rivers Park and other places like the Bandshell where many encampments can be found. What uh, is your opinion of that and how can it be addressed? Well, once again, we have a homeless houselessness issue that is not specific to Glenwood Springs. It's a nationwide problem. Um, the magnitude of which varies seasonally and also according to the size of your community. Um, so I think it has to be addressed, but it is way more complex. It is, has to do with economics. It has to do with housing. It has to do with mental health support. It has to do with other temporary forms of support as well as psychological issues. So it is complex. We do have a regional built for zero team and a coordinator, I think will help us deal with the problem. Unlikely we can solve it. I don't believe that um, it is a problem or an issue that should be driving however decisions as to how we run the city, what amenities we provide, whether we provide bathrooms and benches, but we are naive not to recognize that it is a situation that is complex, broad-based and won't go away. And we have to deal with it in a, in a multiple um, form of solutions and alliances, including outside alliances outside of our town, as well as within. So no easy question and no easy answer. Thank you. Charlie, 90 seconds. I agree with everything that Sumner said and want to note the fact that the city council, I think in the first year of my service, retained Debbie Wild, formerly of Youth Zone, to help us work on the Built for Zero program. And she has identified very strongly where those, those areas are of need. She's still working to some level at that, but we have developed a regional uh, group that is working toward dealing with the problems with homelessness. Homelessness is caused by economics, it's caused by drug addiction, it's caused by other types of addiction, it's caused by other types of mental health problems, and those are complex issues that need a broad-based solution. MindSprings and other groups are now working together to begin to look at a regional solution because this isn't something that if they aren't, they aren't here, they're gonna be somewhere else, or if they aren't somewhere else, they're gonna be here. And I agree, it doesn't drive city policy, but if you look at Portland, if you look at Denver, if you look at any of the big cities right now, they have encampments everywhere. They'd have them on Grand Avenue in front of the stores. We have placed as much as we can, and we're limited by certain federal decisions, court decisions, we've limited as much as we can where people cannot camp in order to try to not have them interfere on tourism, which is the economic generator of this city. Response? Not at all, thank you. Uh, Charlie, traffic and parking are two big concerns among citizens and commuters. What can the city do to help alleviate these problems? I'll take the last one first because we talked a little bit about traffic already. Parking has, has a downtown parking, parking in North Glenwood. Those are significant areas that we need to look at. 
However, last year we directed staff and we've begun the process of becoming Kevin active parking enforcement. I don't like to broadcast the fact, but I don't think, think everybody knows we really haven't had parking enforcement since COVID because we haven't had the staffing to be able to do that. So it's very difficult. We have hired, we have put out a request for a proposal to get electronic uh, license recognition, which will allow us not only to see parking violators, but also to stop the two hour shuffle. I believe that if those problems, if those uh, don't show solutions to how we get to, to the parking problem, there are other ways of, of doing that. The other thing we need to do is we need to create a circulator so we bring the people that are at the motels on 6 and 24 and over in the meadows into downtown without them driving into town. Parking is the biggest problem is during the summer months when most of our tourism traffic is here. So if we can keep that traffic out of downtown, we can do, we can do that by providing a circulator, a nice little trolley or something like that that people want to get on, not just a bus and it runs frequently, that's a good way to begin solving both parking and some of the downtown traffic issues. Well, traffic and parking are clearly related. We have two different issues. We have that circulating within town, both by our residents and visitors, and that going through town. Uh, I believe that, as has been mentioned, Downtown parking, and I understand council has kind of pushed that down the road a little bit, at least till the next session. Enforcement initially is probably the solution to seek rather than paid parking at this time. Um, a lot of that will depend on Chief Darris and others. Um, I believe also we need to seek out employers like Valley View and others and RE1 to help us solve solutions perhaps for the employees that are coming in and out of town. Um, we have lessons I think we need to revisit from the bridge closure that seem to help in terms of getting visitors as well as commuters across town without driving as much. I think we also have to seek more help and evaluate what we're getting for our dollar from RAFTA, where they can help us with Ride Glenwood, with shuttles, and with park and rides in other locations that may also diminish the pressure uh, in and out of town, downtown versus driving in. So there are many aspects of the solution. Thank you. City is working with RAFTA. We created a boo study and that has been completed. That, that our transportation commission, the city council are working with RAFTA to try to find better circulation for both Ride Glenwood and the RAFTA buses. They're not easy solutions, just like anything else is an easy solutions. We need to find ways of getting people that last mile because Raft, Raft and Ride Glenwood don't serve a good portion of Glenwood. We've got to figure out how to get those people to other transportation. And then we need to make sure that we work with the county to get better transportation and more people getting on the buses in the western part of the county. Unfortunately, we don't control all that. When we closed the bridge, we had a lot of control because they couldn't get through town. But now it's happened at one of the meetings that someone and I both attended a couple of months ago. Somebody said, well, if I'm sitting in my car and the bus is sitting next to me, why should I be on the bus? I might as well be in my car. We have to work on that mindset and get people to say, I'd rather be on the bus than in a car. And that'll reduce traffic from West Glenwood, uh, West uh, Garfield County. Infrastructure. Pretty wide open subject. What are the biggest short-term and long-term challenges facing Glenwood Springs and what solutions would you consider as a city councilor? Could you state the question again? Yes. Infrastructure, oh. biggest short-term and long-term challenges. And who is first, Ron? You. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that is one of the elephants in the room with any city. Um, the good news is um, staff and um, Matt Langhorst just listed an extensive list of 2023 projects, as well as the last two years, there's been extensive work in refurbishing, resurfacing, and working on our infrastructure, both in terms of roads, uh, new roads like Midland, um, the uh, broadband, electric, and water. So that is ongoing in any city. I think the... Um, other major obstacle will come up in terms of ongoing funding, and it'll be imperative on the city, on the council, to convince the community 
that we need a renewal, if not an increase in our street and improvement tax. That'll be a major role and it, it'll involve a lot of credibility and trust, which I would hope to build. Um, in addition to that, we've already learned that we have a big issue partly out of our control, partly in, in terms of what happens fire and weather wise, um, in terms of rockfall and rivers, and those we definitely need to address um, with partnerships from the feds and states, which fortunately we are doing. So those are some of the major issues we have to deal with. Infrastructure Glenwood encompasses a number of things. I'll leave straights to last. We have an electric system, we have a water system, we have a sewer system, we have a broadband system, and we hopefully soon will have a single hauler trash system. As a council over the last four years, we have taken the courageous move to make sure there's long-term funding to support the electric water and sewer system. Yes, you've seen rate increases, but we made those difficult decisions because it was good for the quality of life of the city of Glenwood Springs. So there's good water service, there's good water, and there's adequate sewer and electric. We've also, as I mentioned earlier, commenced a comprehensive street reconstruction plan. What Matt Langhorst just released is part of the plan that was discussed in 2019 and is going forward. The biggest challenge, you all see it every day. Costs are going up. Construction costs are going up by anywhere from five to 10% a year. And yes, the street tax will have to be renewed in the next four years. And it's gonna take a conscious, brave effort by council to find the right answer to repeal and reenacting that in an appropriate uh, amount so that we can continue this comprehensive street reconstruction program. It is tough decisions like that that we must make and I have made. Sure, I would also say that part of this issue will be dealt with our new manager who I believe the contract begins today uh, for Beverly. And it'll be imperative on the council and us to set the priorities and budget strategies for her, which I would include, which I suspect will include the aspects of infrastructure, but also just importantly, what we're dealing with behind the scenes is getting adequate staffing. We are understaffed and that's a budget issue that affects how effectively we can do everything else. And I'm hoping we can also solve that in almost every department. And one last thing I'd say is about water. We often, I mean, besides the water issues that were affected by the treatment plan and the fire, we often sit here with senior water rights and the upper Colorado a little bit cocky um, as opposed to what's going on down in the seven state pack. I think looking forward generations, we need to start thinking about additional water storage, which we have the right to do up on the flat tops. Um, that discussion, discussion, the cost would be prohibitive now, but the discussion needs to begin for the future. Thank you. Charlie, lately we've seen a, a greater sense of community on a regional level. One thing that comes to mind is the uh, wildfire collaborative that was recently or is forming. With so many common issues shared by towns and municipalities across the valley, do you think that approach is feasible when it comes to local government? What's the last part of that? Do you think that approach, that the collaborative approach is feasible when it comes to local government? First of all, yes, I already talked about regional planning for both transportation and housing. And I think those are not only critical, but important. Too often, the communities in this valley from Aspen out to Parachute have competed with each other and have not looked for collaborative, better solutions that meet the needs of each of the communities. We all challenge each other for the sales tax dollars that drive our economy because that's how we pay for things. Glenwoods is paid for, as you know, a great portion by the tourists. But we need to work with every community in this valley in order to come up with regional solutions, transportation, development of housing, traffic, and all these things will bring better, say, a state of life for all of us, not only here in Glenwood Springs, but also with those other communities. We have to reach out to shake hands and not to be pushing against each other. So it involves both the city and the county government. We all need to work together to find effective solutions to the overwhelming problems we've been talking about here tonight. Was your question wildlife specific? 
wildfire specific Ron, well, that or was an example specific. of collaboration okay. the wildfire collaborative that's forming right now with so a good approach the answer is yes we need to do again any collaborative work we can particularly here on the western slope where we are number one fighting against huge pressure from the front range for funding for water for infrastructure and funds the more we can collaborate with the entire western slope politically, economically, municipality-wise, and county-wise, we have a better chance of getting a reasonable or fair share piece of the pie. That is huge. Um, and also, specifically, we are interrelated in terms of tourism. But again, back to the specific wild, wildfire solution as an example. If Glenwood gets its solution, well, then that's going to involve CDOT, the state, the state patrol, the county, and local enforcement plan to deal with shutting down Interstate 70 and Highway 82 so we can get out of here. Aspen will face the same type of problem. So collaboration is critical in terms of short-term solutions, economic leverage, and success, yes. And again, I agree with Sumner on these issues. We need to work together. We need to work together both at a local regional level and the Western Slope. And in my role on the board of Colorado Municipal League, I developed close friendships with the city manager of Grand Junction and the mayor of Montrose, as well as a city council member in Durango. We together, and as well as some of the, ur the ur rural uh, Eastern counties and the municipalities are looking to stop the influence of big cities on what happens with our funds. And what's great is this Colorado Municipal League board of directors has worked hard to work together understanding we need to meet the needs of big cities and small cities. That influence that we bring to the state by being actively engaged in Colorado Municipal League is very important to these solutions. Sumner, would you be in favor of the citizens electing the mayor rather than the council? Short, <laughs> short answer, Ron, I don't know. Um, I've heard pros and cons to both. I've heard citizens say why we don't. I'm not sure that that should be a particularly major issue given everything else that's going on in governance. So my answer is, I don't know. If the people want it bad enough, I'm sure we'll see a referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Again, one of the things that I haven't touted much is one of the proposals I had as part of my the things I'd like to get done over the next four years is to create a charter commission. Our charter has not been looked at since I believe the early 60s. The mayor is elected by council members because that's what the charter says. There's been a lot of discussion over the last several years as to whether we should have an elected mayor or not. A lot of people come to me and say, why don't we have an elected mayor? It has its pros, which is the fact that the people get to select the mayor as cons that you could get someone that really isn't very well qualified for those, that job. Those are things that have to be looked at. It's my view we should create a charter commission to look at our charter. And one of the issues in that is that whether or not we should have an elected or appointed mayor and to reach and reach out to the community and get community input on that issue. Not wait for them to bring something to us, but to say, what do you want us to do on this issue? That's something that can be done by commission. It doesn't take away from the council's activities, but allows us to work forward to get a better, more modern charter, including whether or not the mayor is elected or continues to be appointed. Any response? Oh, my only response would be another question. Um, should that occur, I will always question why somebody wants to be elected mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, that question came from a citizen, so. <laughs> Thank you. As did this next one. Um, how important is decorum during city council meetings? Charlie. It is essential. Shortly after I got in city council, I went to the first uh, Colorado Municipal League uh, convention. I went to a seminar given by Bob Widner, who was a municipal attorney for a number of municipalities. And he had created the rules of Bob Widner or something to that effect. And I got a hold of him and said, can I plagiarize those? And he allowed me to do it. I wrote a series of not only procedural rules, but which modified Robert's Rules of Order and made it much more simple but also a number of rules of how we should act as council members. 
whether we should have our cell phones or our computers and using those while we're attending the city council business. After a number of months, we the city council enacted that, that uh, protocol. I would like to say we followed it. I don't think that we necessarily have, but I believe that it is important that we run this council so that we get to give our input so you hear what we're deciding but also so that we give you time to give us valuable input into how we should make those decisions. And the best way we can have it is by example, by showing how we can be responsible decision makers with the ability to make decisions without getting into bickering and fighting over little things. Opposing views get better solutions. Opposing views working collaboratively get the best decisions. Well, decorum is absolutely essential. And unfortunately, I think over the last few years, there's been an erosion of the appearance of decorum on several occasions that has somewhat eroded the confidence and trust of the community, whether it's warranted or not, it's been a factor. I have a history of collaboration without necessarily the negativity of compromise where compromise is somebody gives up something. Collaboration is when people combine to, to come up with common solutions that satisf satisfy them. I believe in governance with dignity and I have an experience of that. I also believe it's very important that dissension is important as long as it's done with civility. And when a decision is made by a board, whether it's seven, six, one, five, two, four, three, that becomes the decision of the board. It is not the role then of me as a dissenter to say, I didn't want that. That's been said. It is now the decision of the board and we should move forward with it. Thank you. I think I'll just echo what the last thing that Sumner said. I think it's really important that once a decision is made is that we carry out that decision. You could say I wasn't happy with that decision for this reason or that, but it's important that we support the direction of this council. I think that gives a better perception that we are working not just together, but for the best interest of all the members of the community. All right, we move on to closing statements. Charlie, uh, two minutes. Thank you. First of all, for those who are here present and those, I can't see anybody on the screen, but those in the video audience, thank you for being here and listening to us tonight. You've heard some and I talk about a number of significant issues that are facing this city over the next four years. I think that you have seen whether or not we can meet those needs. It's my view that in, in I guess it's always eager when you're running for office, that I have the skill set, the knowledge, and the compassion to do this job and do it well. I've served this community in many capacities for 47 years. I've served the city of Glenwood Springs as a municipal judge, a city attorney, and for the last 15 years, is that right? Since 2008, I don't want to do the math in my head. I've served this on various boards and commissions and the city council, all with the idea of making this a better place to live and to keep that great community character that we have. My knowledge in city finances and budget is an invaluable resource to this city council. I'm able to look at things and to look at the financial parts of, the, of every decision we make, make sure the funds are coming from the right pockets and going to the right places. We have a myriad of funds and we have to spend them wise, wisely to get the best product for all of you. As I've noted, we're facing increasing challenges of inflation, providing workforce housing and reducing the impact of traffic in Glenwood Springs. These all require regional cooperation. They all require effective leadership. My mantra is vision, leadership, experience, and knowledge. I believe I bring all those and ask you to vote for me as Ward 3 representative. Thank you. Sumner, two minutes. Sure. Thank you to the chamber, Ron, KMTS, Michelle, and all of Glenwood. I believe that putting me on city council you will get a representative who strives for inclusion, collaboration, and to come up with solutions and guidance for city issues, and one who has a record of past and effective governance. Much of that record is on my Sumner Schachter for Glenwood City Council Facebook page. You're welcome to visit, and there are handouts out in the hall. 
my service on school board, planning and zoning, literacy outreach, Roaring Fork Education Foundation, the two seat commission, the housing commission have all, as well as Imagine Glenwood, have all shown that I value community input and diverse opinions and can help preserve, enhance and protect our cherished Glenwood characteristics. Whoops, I hope that's not an indicator of the results. <laughs> While enhancing credibility and trust on council. I also have a history of financial expertise and the ability with a team to establish financial stability when there was none. Um, past performance is not a guarantee of future results, but a good indicator of that. I will listen, learn, and lead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. Good luck, Ryan. Next, I'd like to invite up the Ward 3, or the uh, at-large candidates, Tony Hershey and Aaron Zielinski. <laughs> begin with opening statements begin with tony hershey two minutes thank you ron um i've been on the glenwood springs city council now for four years and in that four years i've fought for some things and whether the issue is decorum or opposition or being a collaborator or a dissenter. I, I want to talk to you just briefly about those accomplishments. Streets. I oppose the street tax because, not because I'm against the streets, but when I ran, there was no clear picture of where the money was going to be spent. As Mr. Wilman said, since that time, that refocused this council. 480 Donegan, an ill-conceived project where a majority of the people were in this room and in this community voted against it, 60% of the people voted against it. The airport, again, there was a probably a majority of this council or certainly a plurality that wanted to consider closing it, putting something else there, making a way for a bridge. And I oppose that and we, don't, we haven't lost the airport. And when I talk about streets, I talk about infrastructure. Frankly, our streets are an embarrassment, the potholes, the problems um, over by the meadows that we are responsible for just driving around today. Um, you know, I feel like I'm on the Russian front in the in the Soviet army during World War II, and I have to dodge my T-34 around these potholes. It's ridiculous, and it has to be addressed. For too long, and this was not this current council, but prior councils focused on 7th Street and beautification and the downtown, which was nice but at the cost of everything else. So I ran to be that voice of, I'd say half the people in this community, not all of them, but probably half. I think the other five or six probably represent the other half. So what I've endeavored to do for the last four years is speak for those people. Sometimes you win when you're on a council, sometimes you lose, but I promise you that I will be, continue to be that voice for the minority. Thank you. Erin, two minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Erin Slinsky candidate at large. I'm a longtime resident of Glenwood Springs. Um, I've been fortunate to live here, raise my family, grow my family business. And, um, you know, this community has given a great deal to myself and my family. Now that we've sold our businesses, I find myself with, um, sorry, now that we, uh, we sold our businesses, I find myself with the time and the desire to give back to the community has given us so much. You know, I uh, we have the focus and the flexibility to be accessible to the citizens and the businesses of Glenwood Springs so that we can tackle some of these complex issues together. Glenwood Springs has the opportunity to purposefully evolve, not just get swept along in growth. I have a close connection to the reality of living paycheck to paycheck and questioning whether or not you can remain in this community. 
um, you know, adjusting to circumstances that are unforeseen and outside of your control, business concerns such as staffing, um, attracting customers to your door. These are all very much in the front of my mind. And I think these will be valuable perspectives at the council table. I come with no set agenda, but my values are clear and consistent. I give priority and listen to the voices of the citizens of Glenwood Springs. I support the interests of business and the economic vibrancy that makes a community thrive. I'd like to see providing the resources to maintain our infrastructure and our recreational assets. I would also like to see us look to successful neighboring communities for solutions to our workhouse, um, workforce housing questions. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Ron, I wanted to be mayor so bad that I sat in the wrong seat. So I <laughs> Just kidding, Jonathan. <laughs> All right, first question, we'll start with Aaron. Uh, name the three most important issues facing Glenwood Springs and your ideas on how to address them. I think, um, I think probably one of the biggest ones is, you know, a lot of the quandaries that we're facing with housing, with traffic, with congestion, with carrying capacity, you know, it all comes from that sustainable growth um, that the community can buy into. And so I feel like, you know, looking to growth is not just getting bigger or development, but, you know, that evolution of what we already have and using our resources efficiently and purposefully. Um, I think, you know, the workforce housing is a huge issue. The citizens of Glenwood Springs showed a great deal of faith when voting in the 2C. And I think that now the onus is on its leadership to make sure that they rise to that occasion and come up with solutions that are diverse and sustainable. And, you know, we won't build ourselves out of this problem. And so some have touched on some of the things that I've seen that are interesting as far as like the buy down and the down payment assistance, et cetera. And, you know, finally, I think um, character and the way we're perceived um, working with our partners in the county, in the state, in the greater region, I think that that is going to make all of these problem solvings much more simple. And I actually think that's a huge uh, concern that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Streets, housing, and streets. And when I say streets, I mean infrastructure. So just briefly about infrastructure. Again, we can't be a first-class community if we don't have a, a first-class streets. And again, I'm not blaming um, the, the council that is currently holding, or even the, just the prior one. But I think Charlie touched on the fact that for 15 or 20 years, it was just ignored. And then they came to the voters and said, hey, pass this big giant tax so we can fix the streets. That has to be addressed. We've done a lot of work. As for housing, I, I think what Aaron said and, and what Charlie said too is correct in Sumner, you're not gonna build yourself out of this problem. But I will tell you that it is not the government role to give people a house, to give them a house for ownership. I don't support that. I support workforce housing, and that's rental housing. But that's not, um, I don't think the government should be or should enter the free market. We cannot provide an infinite number of housing, and that's what you're saying. When I hear a, a number like a 1,000 new free market homes or market homes or, or single family homes, that's another four or 5,000 people. And I know further in this debate, we're gonna talk about supermarkets, streets and infrastructure. I don't know that this community can handle another 4,000 people. I don't know that it would be Glenwood Springs anymore. And I don't know if a lot of the people here would wanna live here if it was twice the size it is now, population wise. Thank you. Aaron, response, one minute. So. You know, yeah, we're not going to build ourselves out of this. And I don't know that we're talking necessarily about creating habitat for 4,000 more people. I think that, you know, what are the things that we keep talking about is our, our character and, you know, what kind of community we want to live in. And I think embracing, you know, young families and, you know, having some sort of pathway to ownership is part of that. You know, do you want to have young professionals come and leave as soon as they start a family because they can't house themselves here. No. So I think that some of these other solutions are critical for the greater conversation. Continuing on the, the affordable or attainable housing subject, uh, Tony, uh, it's a statewide issue, um, regional issue. Glenwood Springs has taken some steps to tackle the problem. What more can be done at the local level, even regionally? 
someone I met with this week, very smart person on Thursday said that there are Glenwood problems and then there are just problems. And affordable housing is a problem. It's a problem here. It's a problem in Denver. I was watching the mayoral debate uh, there. Affordable housing and, or workforce housing is a problem, but it, you cannot just create an infinite supply. We can't do it. So we have to work regionally. But having grown up in Aspen, I'm not interested in housing Aspen workers. Now we can say housing is deed restricted. We can build housing, but look what happened at 480 Donegan when, when you tried to do an expansion. Like Sumner, I agree with him 100%. Some of those projects he voted against on PNZ, that's not really classic, in my mind, affordable housing. It's certainly not workforce housing. We need to house workers. But like Aaron said, you also need an entry in for, for people who want to live here and move here. You know, some people can afford to come here and rent maybe for a little bit. Maybe there's some condominiums they can purchase up and move up the housing chain. One thing that this council did, which I was very supportive, is addressing the um, Airbnb or VRBO, which took, particularly during the pandemic, and a lot of this housing issue stems from that, took that housing out of the market. And I think we put a lot of that back in. But I, again, I just don't see building skyscrapers in Denver. We have three mountains around us. I just don't see us solving that infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean housing issue with a magic wand because it's, it can't be solved anywhere else. Thank you. 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we're not always going to be able to creatively solve a problem that's greater than what we have in our community. And so, you know, I do think that looking to other solutions, looking outside of our immediate community for what has been successful is going to be vital. Um, I'm attending the work, what is it, the Workforce Housing Coalition or up in Aspen on Wednesday. And I hope to learn more there. Um, you know, certainly this is a new problem to my awareness. And so I don't have the opinion that I'm going to be able to personally solve it. But what I am going to do is, you know, spend a lot of time looking to what is working and more importantly, what isn't working. Because, you know, let other people make the mistakes and let's pay attention to what isn't working and don't do that. So, you know, I think that we're going to have to be open minded and a little bit humble in how we seek these solutions. Thank you. Got any response? Yeah, um, it is a, a regional issue for us, particularly given where we are located, 45 minutes from one of the most popular resorts in the entire country. But Glenwood Springs has certain limitations. I, I've lived in Los Angeles, I've lived in Denver. Those are some nice places, but they're different. And we don't have the ability here to create that sort of urban sprawl. I just don't think that we're going to be able to build. Where are you going to put it? I heard the Denver mayor debate and they were talking about maybe you could build on already existing public land like over parking garages and Denver has a lot of that. But what they're talking about building is not housing where you would be, oh, I'm gonna buy a house and live in Denver. No, this is housing that is transitional. Um, Aspen has not able to solve this problem in almost 50 years, and they house about 30%, maybe a little more, of their employees, and they've spent millions and millions of dollars, and they have huge um, resources and infrastructure to do that. We have, we just can't do that, or else you you fail to have the same community. You've created something else, and, and again, I think that's an issue. Thank you. Aaron, uh, developments. Is Glenwood Springs... Overdeveloped, or is there room for growth, and where, and what type of growth? So, you know, that's such a hot button topic. Um, I think part of development is redevelopment. So, I think we need to look at our assets and, you know, evaluate are we using them in the most efficient manner possible. Um, certainly, there are areas where we could do something. Um, development doesn't necessarily always mean like putting in more housing. Um, I think that we could do a little bit better with some of our parks and some of our open space that we could make those productive um, revenue generating and uh, still keep that character and keep that, you know, kind of sense of nature and one of the things that makes our community more unique and special. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think anytime that you talk about development or growth, you have to be very careful that you are being a good steward of your land and of your public. And I think listening to the citizens is going to be vital in choosing what projects are in keeping with 
this character and comprehensive plan that you know others have worked so hard at? The problem is we haven't listened to our community. I mean, you have to go no further back than the 480 Donegan vote. I saw that coming like Lawrence Arabia across the desert, um, uh, Omar Sharif in Lawrence Arabia across the desert. It was coming, you could see it. You could see how angry people were. They went out and they got a thousand signatures in two weeks. The election was over before it even occurred. If we don't listen, then there's going to be a revolt. I, I, you know, development and change are inevitable. You know, people move to places and they go, they want to like that snow globe thing. Let's put a snow globe on it. There's going to be redevelopment. There's going to be change. But God, this is such a beautiful place. Just looking out the window, looking at the three mountains that surround us, the river, the canyon, the skiing nearby, the world-class fishing. Why would we want to destroy that by creating massive redevelopment? Where are these people? I know we're going to talk about grocery stores. Where are these people going to shop? Where are they going to drive? Where are their kids going to go to school? How many policemen are we going to hire? How many, um, how many more uh, big trucks are we going to have coming through this community delivering food and delivering stuff? It's a limited uh, issue that we can address. Of course, there's going to be some redevelopment, but it has to be smart. It has to be in the right location. And we can't you know, destroy Glenwood to save it. And that is my concern. And that's why I've been fighting and sitting up here for four years trying to do. Thank you. Yeah, so I, again, I think it sounds fundamentally, Tony and I are not in opposition on the topic. I think that we have a basic agreement. Massive redevelopment is not something that I think anybody on either side of the table wants. Um, I think if you listen to the citizens and the constituents of Columbus Springs, you're not going to go down that road. But, you know, do we need some more assets? Do we need to have some more, you know, resources available as far as, you know, a maybe some more services, a grocery store. You know, we have such a thing as carrying capacity. You know, do we have the infrastructure and the resources available to manage any kind of growth and development? All of that has got to be part of the conversation. And so, you know, listen to the people, listen to um, those who know what our resources are, listen to what the people want and, you know, work within those constraints and then make something that everybody feels good about. Tony, we've heard a, a lot about um, character and charm of Glenwood Springs. How would you maintain that appeal for locals, tourists, visitors, while at the same time growing the economy, adding some jobs, improving the downtown corridor? Well, I think we spent a lot of time, and I think Ingrid would agree, and I'm sorry, Aaron would agree, that the downtown core has gotten a lot of attention from the government and 7th Street, and I know we're looking to 6th Street. So... I think there's a, maybe a little bit more we can do. What I'd like to do to is to include the rest of the town. I think West Glenwood feels like for many years, they've just been many decades, they've been ignored. I know my friends near the hospital and streets on Blake and Bennett feel like um, they're, they've been ignored, that their infrastructure has been ignored. Where, where Jonathan lives, we just finished Midland and that was a great project, but I think that sometimes they feel like they're not included. We're one community. And, and I take very seriously, I know we have we had Marco and we had Charlie here and, and, and Mitchell, and they're going to in, um, represent wards. I feel that as I'm elected by all the people, or I was elected by all the people, I represent every single person. I think Charlie feels that way too, but it's a little bit different. That the reason I ran is I saw a council, and this again is the prior council before Mayor Gotis became mayor, that didn't focus on those needs of the community, and they paid... I think a bit of a price politically and people um, are angry. To keep that character and to keep that community, we have to serve all those people and, and be inclusive. And I think sometimes we fail. If there's just one of seven people up here and they say, hey, what about this group? And again, that's maybe 20 or 30% of the people. I think that's important. Everybody's voice needs to be heard here. And that's the fundamental purpose of representative government. Thank you. Yeah. So I think, you know, character is, it's a very big statement because that speaks to, you know, the personality and, you know, what your community represents. And Glenwood's character has evolved quite a bit just in, you know, I've lived here now for 19 years and um, it's evolved quite a bit just in that time period. You know, we have a really large and diverse um, ethnic population 
big Latino uh, influence that I think doesn't always feel that they have a voice. And I feel like embracing that and um, honoring that is going to be critical to the long-term success. And I think that, you know, you have a unique opportunity by involving people into the future of what happens to their community and listening to the people is, you know, vital. I love the idea that I could be an at-large representative. I think that that's exactly what I want to be. I was very successful in my business with listening to the people and what they wanted and responding to that. And that guided a lot of my actions. And that would just be the same way that I would lead at a council table is I would listen to what the people are telling me and try and represent that in my decision-making. And I think that's how you maintain character and recognize that can character, you know, it does change and it does evolve, but at its heart, at its core, it needs to be something that you're proud of. One, one minute. Um, you know, Aaron brings up a very important issue that maybe the lack of representation on this council that tends to skew a little bit older and maybe a little more financially. Uh, but, you know, I, I have a neighbor and he he's up at six in the morning and I see him every morning and he fixes hot tubs and pulls up in Aspen and his kids go to school here and his wife works. How is he supposed to serve on this council when he comes home at six or seven o'clock at night? It's just not possible. And I think that's part of the reason that not just um, part of our ethnic community, but younger people have just not been able to do this. They don't just have the time. If I have two or three jobs, as I used to have in Aspen, it was really hard to serve on a council or on a committee or volunteer for something. I think that's, that's really important. You know, a small business is not, unfortunately, it's not a government. You know, that, that, that business reports to the owner. A larger company may be a, a, a reports to its stockholders, but a government that reports to everybody. We represent everyone and we have to be responsible to our owners and do the right thing. Aaron, let's talk about a grocery store. What would it take, you think, to get a, a grocery store to Glenwood, a second store to Glenwood Springs? You know, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I'm shocked that it must clearly take a lot more than I realize because we haven't had one in a very long time. And it does seem like it is just right for the taking. And I'm surprised that, um, I don't know, I, I know that margins and things like perishable goods is not great. And so you probably need to have, um, you know, a certain traffic flow and, you know, for whatever reason, the numbers must not pan out to a lot of the bigger players. But yeah, I think that we definitely could benefit from a regional grocery store. And I agree with everybody else that's already spoken that the west side of town seems to be the natural place for that. Um, you know, I guess we have to ask ourselves, is Glenwood had the character as being known as a business friendly community? And maybe that has something to do with why we've not been able to attract a grocery store to our community. I don't know. Um, this is something that I'm really excited about the possibility of learning why, you know, what leads to these kind of opportunities and decisions and, and what do I not know that I need to know to help, you know, make these things happen. But yeah, I think the citizens are not being fully served in that way and some other fundamental services. And it would be great to see those things happen. Ron, if I could take a contrarian view here. I talked to the manager at Kroger at City Market. I don't think it's government's role to dictate winners and losers and to encourage, certainly we can encourage certain businesses and we have done that and that's a good thing. I will say we have a Walmart, we have a Target, there's Nature Groceries, there's also Costco nearby, Super Walmart. There's a big supermarket in Carbondale and a big one in Rifle too. And then you could even drive further if you want. And some people do for their groceries, particularly they did so during the pandemic. I don't know that there's just a snap your finger solution and say, okay, we're going to put in another grocery. My concern is that if you're going to grow this community without that in place, and that, you know, 4ID Donegan talked about there was going to magically just be a supermarket pop up there, and they had connections, and they were going to do that. I, I could see that not happening, just like certain things at the mall that you've already heard about are going to be there don't appear. We do have options for shopping. I wish, you know, I know that market is, is very, very busy, but their margins are small, and I think, you know, Safeway is a real estate company and a grocery store, and I think they felt that they couldn't be profitable here. I wish we had, you know, another big grocery store here just to have that choice. I don't know that, you know, and people had their favorite and didn't go to maybe the other one, but 
city council can certainly encourage and create. I hope, I hope Aaron is wrong. I hope we're a good place for businesses to come, but I think those businesses have to be successful long-term. And if you dictate or force a business in here and or pay them off, and you're, then you're going to be subsidizing for a long time. And I don't think that's a solution either. Thank you. Can yeah. I, respond? I don't know that um, seeking economic opportunity is forcing the issue or, um, you know, kind of creating something. I don't know that you have to subsidize a business to entice them to come to your community. Um, there are, you know, certainly some small rebates and some other things that can be used as incentives, but I think, you know, the opportunity should present itself and be enticing just on that basis. And so, you know, like I said, clearly this isn't a simple uh, problem with a simple solution or else it would have already happened. But, you know, the people have requested some additional options as far as like shopping for some simple, basic, fundamental thing like food. And so, you know, if we are here to listen to the population and the people and the citizens of Glowwood Springs, that's what they're asking for. And I think that it needs to be addressed. Tony, uh, traffic and parking, two big concerns among citizens and commuters, locals alike. Uh, what, what can the city do to help alleviate those problems? Um, well, I think, was it Charlie or was it Sumner who let the cat out of the back that we haven't been doing? I'm sorry, Chief. We haven't been doing a lot of enforcement with the two-hour parking, particularly in the downtown area. I don't think that parking is horrendous. It is bad during the week. If there's a jury trial next door or if there's big events, there are some issues. I think people like I want to go to Treads and buy something, or I want to go to Cooper Street Liquor, and I'm going to park right in front. I'm not going to walk from my house. I'm not going to walk a block. And I think there's some of that. I love the idea of the shuttle buses taking people around. But people, you know, in this country, for whatever reason, and it's going to take us time to change that, really love their cars. We, I know that the county has spoke about building a, a giant parking lot here across from the car, courthouse to expand that, to make that two or three levels. But God, parking is so expensive. And we built that garage on Cooper and um, it's expensive to maintain and it has issues, um, but parking and traffic are directly related. If I'm driving around looking for a space, I'm creating traffic, right? And um, if I can't park easily, I'm going around and around the block and there's more traffic. But again, I've lived in Los Angeles. I've lived in New York City. Um, those are those are places where you're on the Ventura Highway for three and a half hours, that's traffic. I think we have some issues. I think. This is a case where the government needs to get involved and where we have some solutions. Finally, I wouldn't support paid parking, not at this time. I just don't think it's a solution for now. And I think it creates inconvenience maybe in the future, but not now. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I I had a business in two different locations in downtown Glowwood Springs and I can speak firsthand to parking. Um, it was always a conflict and it was not, it's a lot of what Tony said, you know, you will walk farther <laughs> at the meadows to get from your car to one of those stores than you would if you parked somewhere in Glenwood and walked to another downtown business. It's perception, you know, and so some of that you've got to combat perception, you've got to create something that feels walkable. And I think that, you know, the environment has a lot to do with that. If it's a pleasant walk, um, you're not going to begrudge it. You know, you're going to not mind that you walk two blocks to get to where you're going. Um, I agree that I don't think paid parking is a solution right now. I think that it just creates more inconvenience and more obstruction, and people already feel beleaguered enough, and I don't think that that's um, to anybody's benefit. Um, you know, I met with Dan Blankenship with RAFTA, and we talked a lot about, you know, traffic and um, some of the things that can be done and you know, I got a little history about how Aspen has managed their traffic and they've pretty much capped the number of cars. And I know traffic in Aspen seems appalling, but it actually hasn't grown in recent years. And so they're doing something. And I think that we can, you know, look to that and manage the number of cars that pass through and use some of the resources that we have available and some of the greater knowledge that's out there to come up with some solutions that suit our community. Sure. Well, Aspen's a lot different because, particularly in the winter, there's one way and there's one way out, and it's a destination. What Glenwood Springs is, is literally a, what is it, a fork or a triangle, whatever it is, 82 and I-70. So you have cars coming through, you have cars going there, you have traffic from the east and the west coming through Glenwood and then headed towards Aspen and then vice versa. So I, I think that some of the lessons that Aspen has learned is that 
you know, they've just made it almost impossible to get into their community. And that has discouraged people from driving there. And I think that's worked to some extent. And they and RAFTA, thank God for RAFTA, is such a great transportation system that has been able to take some, but not everybody uh, here. Glenwood has sort of different issues because just of the nature of where we are and where we're located. It's a destination for some people with, you know, with the government and the courts and with some businesses that work here. But for some people, it's just a pass through and the local businesses enjoy that too. So I wouldn't want to do anything that would affect businesses in downtown, et cetera, by cutting off traffic or making it hard to get there. But thank you, Ron. Aaron, what, um, what kind of leverage do you think the city can bring to improve evacuation routes when the next natural disaster occurs, uh, collaborating with CDOT and federal authorities? Yeah, I think one of the really positive things that came from the 40 Donegan conversation was that message was received loud and clear, and it opened up some of that, I think, um, kind of receptiveness to having those conversations and coming up with those solutions and recognizing that that is a very real um, concern and, you know, addressing it. So, you know, you've got some ramps that are going to shortcut the west side of town and get people onto I-70 sooner. I think that, um, you know, already working in collaboration with CDOT and opening that conversation um, will help future conversations. And, you know, I think, um, we are limited geographically. There's not a lot of options. And so I think uh, having a plan in place that's already can be like ready to go and coordinating with law enforcement and first responders and making sure that everyone is funneled to the ways that are the fastest way to get out. I think, you know, having that plan already established is going to be critical to saving lives and uh, making people feel safe in their homes. Okay. Absolutely, uh, Aaron is correct. This is something we have to plan for. I remember that relatively small fire a few years ago behind Walmart, and um, I was with my mother, and we were scared. You know, packing up the dog stuff and the and the important things, and do we have to get out? I think that's a scary situation. Again, geographically, mountain, mountain, mountain. One way that way, one went that way. I guess if you head towards Aspen, that's another way, but maybe not. So if there's only three ways in here and two of them are blocked, that's a serious issue. This has to be a focus. And to our credit, and to the mayor's credit, actually, this council has focused a lot on this. And Terry Patch, um, the city engineer, has focused. But, but Aaron's also correct. I think 480 Donegan scared a lot of people and raised some concerns. Like, wait a minute, you're going to stick you know, 350 units here, which could be maybe another 700 to 1500 people, and we're all going to have to get out and it's the same way. Well, Chief Darius, CSP, CDOT, um, DNR, and other people have said, we do have a way out. There are going to be uh, options by the roundabouts in West Glenwood. There's going to be highway options, and we're going to be able to move a large amount of people out of here and keep them safe. This community is no stranger to fires, um, Cole Seam and Storm King, and they're scary. Um, and, uh, you know, you've seen communities in California suffer and people unfortunately lose their lives. We have to be ready here for anything. And I think this council, to its credit, has done a very good job of, of doing that. Thank you. You know, I don't know that any response is needed. Um, you know, that that small Amy's Acres fire out there in West Glenwood was really eye-opening to me. I was dropping my daughter off at a friend's house and I went around the roundabout and I didn't go home and I went right back and I picked her up and I asked if her family wanted to evacuate at the same time. You know, you can see these things brewing and um, there's not a lot of time to react. And so I think, uh, you know, the fact that we have now opened that conversation and we have a plan in place and um, you know, everybody is going to be informed and aware of it. Keep those communications going. You know, there was um, all the signs around last summer that we're talking about, like fire aware. I think that these are the things that as a community we are doing to make sure that both long-term residents and newcomers alike are ready for it. And so I think that we've done ourselves a really useful service in making sure that that happens. Uh, Tony, in terms of infrastructure, what are the biggest short-term and long-term challenges facing Glenwood, and what solutions would you consider as a city councilor? Well, you know, short-term, I think we've been addressing, 
you know, the last time I ran for city council, I was coming back from a debate in, I think at Sopris and I bent the wheel on my car because of the, and if you drive on that road now, it's been addressed. I know we're, we're looking at Blake, but then someone during this debate just sent me a picture outside the meadows, outside her apartment. And it looks like there's a giant hole in the ground where the, the infrastructure is just falling apart. That has to be addressed. It has to be. It's not the most fun thing, fixing potholes and fixing streets, and you don't get a pothole filled named after you, but it has to be done. Uh, if, a, if we want to be a first-class community and a first-class tourist destination, and I think we have been and we are and we're going to be, these are the kind of things you have to address. And when I say streets, I mean infrastructure too. I might also include the police department. People want certain basic things run from their government. They want the water and electricity to come on when they come home and they turn on the water and electricity. They want the police and the fire department to respond. And they want safe, well-lit streets that they can you know, have their kids go to school on and, and be safe and sure. That's what people want. The rest of Everything else I think that goes on, if people are even paying attention, is a lot of noise and what I think Sumner would call inside baseball that maybe people are not paying attention to and don't really care about until it, till you tell them they're going to you're going to build a giant um, apartment building in their neighborhood. I think that's what this council has to focus on. I think to some extent we've done that, but we can do a much better job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, long-term, short-term infrastructure, I think it's ongoing on its maintenance. And it's one of those things that if it's not part of the conversation, that means everybody's doing their job right. You know, uh, Tony is exactly correct. There's just a few things that you expect. Um, and you only know, you know, we just had another power outage last night and it was extensive and, you know, it was over a large geographic area. And we don't know why as a citizen that lives here, I don't know why the power went out. I just know it went out again. And that's unsettling. Um, it doesn't make you feel secure. It doesn't make you feel like, you know, you want to have your own backup plan because it could go out at any time and you've got a plan for that. And so, you know, I think addressing those kind of underlying concerns and, and those unsettling situations are important. Um, but, you know, I looked at the, the streets projects that are coming out for this spring, and I do, I do have confidence that, you know, maybe some of the things that have been neglected in the past are being addressed now. Um, I'm concerned that, you know, the Wolfson area is not that long. It has, it's not that old of a development and it's really in bad shape. And so I think that we need to look at how we're doing projects and how we're building things. Um, you know, should our parking garage be needing as much maintenance as it does? I question that. Um, you know, should those roads be needing as much repair as they do? I question that, you know, so I think that we need to also um, hold kind of the, our contractors accountable and make sure that what we're getting is the best bang for our buck. You know, absolutely. I think we have to spend the people's money cautiously. And this electrical thing, I've been complaining that the prior city manager told me to buy a generator. You know, I don't live in Baghdad and that's not a solution. There has to be reliable power all the time. There are outages and there's a giant snowstorm and there's nothing you can do. We get our, our electricity from another provider and it's not always an infrastructure and a squirrel will go on and on one of those little capacitors and electrocute himself and you lose the whole neighborhood. But that's an infrastructure issue. It has to be upgraded. Do we have to bury all our power lines? Maybe we do. Maybe that's something that we have to look into. We have a water system and a sewage system that is old and 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 you're going to have um, sinkholes and, and with the water leaks and other issues. This has to be addressed. Long term, I think that's really where more of the focus needs to be. I think I've helped steer this council in that direction to some extent, but that ship turns a little slowly. In the future, I think we're gonna be more on the path to addressing all of these infrastructure issues, both short-term and long-term. Thank you. Aaron, lately we've seen a greater sense of community on a regional level. One thing that comes to mind is the wildfire collaborative that's forming. Uh, with so many common issues shared by towns and municipalities across the valley, do you think that approach is feasible when it comes to local government? Yeah, I do. I think that um, if you can, you know, have the ability to draw from a greater pool of resources as far as ideas and greater knowledge and, you know, maybe sharing financial burden, et cetera, I think that'll make the end result a much stronger product, um, you know, being cooperative is 
vital. Um, within that process, standing up for, you know, the interests of your region is critical. I think that it's a balancing act, but yeah, I think that, you know, collaborating and cooperating with the greater region and coming up with solutions, you know, it gives you a much greater ability to, you know, have something substantial be the outcome. Um, I, I grew up in Aspen and I, I'm friends with some of the, the council people there and some of their staff. And I talked to them, talked to the mayor and rifle and, and their council and their city manager. I think Carbondale is really a great partner. I, I know um, Marty there and um, some of their former council people have been very supportive. So we can work with them. I don't even think it's just regional. I think it's Denver. I know that um, working closely with our state representatives, Perry and um, Ms. Velasco, and also with um, the senators, but also the national level. It didn't really make the news, but uh, Lauren Boebert was here a few weeks ago and met with this council and talked about um, doing earmarks for South, South um, Bridge and, and finding funding for the federal transportation for that. So it really is, especially I think if the pandemic showed anything, that to get these sort of problems Fix, we have to work together. When it first happened, I think there was a little bit of panic and like, oh my God, Rifle's got this rule and Newcastle's not doing this and Carbondale has this and what about Aspen? And I think that changed a lot that we are, you know, we are, I just remember growing up, it seemed like Glenwood Springs and Aspen were like thousands of miles apart and they're really much closer and maybe not so much culturally and economically, but have some of the same issues and we can work with them and they want to solve issues. I was talking to Commissioner Clapper and she's talking about building um, or buying some housing down here or maybe a hotel to house some workers. And that's controversial. RAFTA has used hotels and stuff here and bought property here for housing. So it's that kind of regional thing, Ron, that I can think address all these bigger problems. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's undeniable that you know, the city of Glenwood Springs has its population, but the citizens of Glenwood Springs are much greater than that. You know, a lot of times, I mean, they're county residents, they don't live in the actual like city geographic footprint, but they're very much part of our community. And I think that cooperating with the region at large embraces the voice of everybody that may be not fully represented by the ones that are actually making the decisions. Tony, would you be in favor of the citizens electing the mayor rather than the council? Yes. <laughs> and just to expand on that, why? I think um, having served on a council where the mayor was elected by the people, I think it's more representative. What I, I understand the problem of like, oh my God, you're going to get just somebody who's popular, maybe doesn't know what they're doing. And because the six or the seven people here know how someone might be. What I'd like to see considered, and again, this would all require a change, as Charlie said to the charter, is you have a mayor elected. He's a non-voting mayor or she is a non-voting member. She would be there like sort of like Kamala Harris to break ties, but would not otherwise vote, would run the meeting and her focus or his focus would be on, you know, moving the meeting along, getting the people involved and making everything sure. But again, that would require charter. But, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Gotis and I have had our disagreements. He represents a small ward. Maybe it's better if you have a mayor who represents everybody and speaks for the whole community. But again, you know, if we're going to do a charter change, that's going to be a decision that everyone's going to make, not, not just, you know, council or city staff or the city attorney. But I, I definitely think it's something that we should look at. Me, per I personally would support it. But if it's something that the people like it the way it is, I guess we could keep it that way. But again, yes. Ditto. So <laughs> there we go. I um, have talked to several people about, you know, the charter. And um, I think that re-examining the charter is something that, you know, should be seriously taken on. And I love that it would be something that would be put back to the people of Glenwood and give them that voice and, um, you know, help them guide their leadership. I think that these would all help kind of repair some of the um, barriers or some of the division that is, um, it seems to be present right now between the citizens of Glenwood Springs and its leaders. And uh, I would absolutely embrace that process. And like I said, it's something I personally would support. Any response? 
No, I, I, I think I agree with Aaron. I think I would personally respond, uh, support it. Again, if everyone in the community got to elect the mayor, as they do in um, Aspen, I believe Carbondale too, like, okay, that's our mayor. We voted for, for her. She represents everybody. And she's speaking for not just for her little small constituency, for, but for everyone. And she doesn't maybe have a larger political agenda other than to have you know the meetings run smoothly and represent the people. And I think that's a great idea. All right, last question. And um, as a news guy, I love a lively council discussion. Something that gets spirited, makes for good headlines. Erin, how important is decorum during city council meetings? I think decorum is very important. I love rigorous debate, and I always have. It's something that, you know, my friends uh, know this about me, and um, there's nothing I like better than sitting down and, you know, talking to somebody who doesn't have the same perspective or the same opinion as me. And, you know, you really grow your mind that way. Um, and I think that you come up with a much greater understanding of every issue um, but you can't have that rigorous debate where it's a sharing of ideas and, and experiences if you don't have a fundamental respect for each other, I think. Um, and it diminishes the value of the output. Um, it, it belittles the process. Um, it, it belittles the participants in the process. And I think that it should always be beneath leadership to degrade themselves to lacking decorum. It is not the job of your representative to vote with the majority. I think people say that someone's being rude when they disagree with them. When they agree with him, oh, that guy's in there, she's fighting for me, she is representing me vigorously and saying what I, what I want. I think it was Bill Clinton who said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Um, I like the six people who I serve with. I've, I've enjoyed their company, but we're not friends per se in that I have to be nice to them just to be nice with them or to agree and collaborate just to collaborate. That's not governance. I don't know what that is. I think that's what you might do if you were planning a school dance. You'd want everyone to get along and then you'd agree on the theme and everyone would happy and have fun. These are big issues and they're important issues that we're dealing with. And for too long, and the reason I ran is because I felt this council was going in the wrong direction. It's hard to change that ship. I had to file a core request just to find out how much money this uh, Mayor Gamba and his council was spending on 7th Street. That's outrageous. How, why isn't there a more transparent go government? So if I um, appear to raise my voice, that's because I'm upset because this council is not responding to the people. And we saw it with Donegan, and we saw it with the airport, and we saw it with the street tax, and we saw it with other issues. And, each, and issues that I'm gonna talk about in my closing that's gonna come up again that you should know about, where there has to be someone here fighting for the people, fighting for the minority. And if that means you interrupt sometimes, I know that's not appropriate, but it happens. Yeah, you know, again, I don't know how, um... I don't know how I could get somebody to listen to my opposing point of view if I can't speak in a way that can be heard. And I think sometimes if you yell or bluster and uh, interrupt and you just shut that door. And I do think that it is a part of the job description to, if you're going to be fighting for an unpopular perspective, you need to be able to be heard. And I think a lack of decorum compromises that. All right, before we get to closing statements, I want to thank the candidates for participating and the interested voters for listening tonight and viewing. Thanks to our host, Steve Glidwood Springs. Special thanks to Brianna Starbuck for assisting with tonight's technology. This event has been brought to you courtesy of the Glenwood Springs Chamber Resort Association, Glenwood Springs Post Independence, and KMTS. Links to the Zoom recording of tonight's event will be, will be available on kmts.com postindependent.com and glenwoodchamber.com. Election day is Tuesday, April 4th, and this is a mail ballot election. Closing statements, two minutes. We'll begin with Aaron. So thank you. This has been a very interesting process, um, just even getting this far. It has opened up a lot of conversations with uh, different leaders and different um, community members. And, you know, I recognize that I 
have run a small business and that isn't a government, but um, you know, the judgment and the willingness to seek answers and ask questions and know, learn what I don't know, I think is going to prepare me for, you know, this role. I seek to fill a role that has great potential to bring the five wards together. Um, I'd like to be the one that provides some cohesion and balance to council. I am a critical thinker and I embrace collaboration, but that's not just simply getting along. Um, collaboration is more than just coordinating and cooperating. This skill requires a high level of focus and engagement, commitment and trust. It's the willing to work in a novel way with heightened awareness, common and specific goals, and it needs to be mutually beneficial. For collaboration to occur, there must always be shared risk and reward and recognition among the stakeholders. In-depth review of matters is vital to successful collaboration and understanding of opposing point of view. Somehow my opponent makes collaboration sound like a bad thing. I think collaboration allows for resolution, for problems to be solved. And my use of collaboration is a very definition of good governance. I will listen to and represent the citizens of Glover Springs and fight for their priorities and interest. Dissent and disruption simply stops things from getting done. And I think it's time to move beyond that. And I wanna thank Aaron and everyone, everyone including Mitchell, who's not running in, an, in a contested race, but Sumner and Charlie and everyone. It's hard, this is a hard job. And good luck, Mitchell, when you go shopping, when you're on council, then people stop you and ask questions and stuff. This is hard. So I want to thank everyone and, and congratulate everyone for participating in this system. Seven people sit on this council. And if I'm the sole vote on any issue to not raise taxes, to not waste money, if um, then so be it. I support being conservative and responsible with your tax dollars. And, and frankly, I don't always prevail. But that's okay. You will know that there's a person on this council raising those issues and raising those questions. Um, I think collaborator can be a bad word depending on the context, but the way Aaron's using it, it's not a bad word. And I'm happy to collaborate when I can trust people. But when I hear from a member of this council, as I did last week, that they are considering bringing up 480 Donegan again to build housing there again, after we had a vote of 60 to 40 against it, then how can I trust and collaborate? How can I be sure that the people are being represented? They're, they want to bring this up again when the voters voted no and to try to stop the Demises from building um, a warehouse. I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. And if I can't trust the people I work for or work with, then I have to trust the people I work for, and that's you. And the people I work for want me to hold everyone up here accountable and to make sure that their views are heard and that they're listened to. I think one of the greatest things that I do on this council is people call me up with little problems. I just got a text about a pothole and I'm going to text Matt Langhorse and maybe next week that pothole is going to be fixed. Is that the greatest thing that I've ever accomplished in my life? I don't know. But that's responsible governor gover governance and it's responsive government. And that's what this government needs to be. That's what this council has to be. Not this sort of back deals, back slapping meeting stuff. It has to be responsive to you and represent you. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do for four more years. Thank you. Thank you again to all the candidates and for the uh, all the questions. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>